thanks very much for coming indeed because this is not uh, okay this is the real time to be here and to listen to the interesting talk of peter but with the rain and these things are not is not very pleasant to to just come here but in any case uh, it's for me a great pleasure again to introduce you uh, professor peter hall from the university of melbourne uh, i think uh, between Juan and me, we have said so many nice things about Peter these days that I don't know really what to, what to say anymore. Let me just tell you something. Um, I met Peter in 1991. 1990. 1990 yeah. in, in Louvain. Well, I was a PhD student at, at this time. He was already someone uh, very recognized in the profession, although he was not much older than me <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since then we have kept contact one from time to to time but um, believe me I have got much contact with many other other many people in the profession but the souvenirs and the reminds I, I got from Peter at this uh, time and I'm now talking about uh, personal uh, behavior and not about uh, him as a scientist has remained in my uh, heart for all these years and uh, this is this was probably of course your CV is uh, there but this was also a very good reason for for me and for Juan to apply for a doctorate or not, or not this causa for him in this university because uh, we really believe that apart from his, his excellent uh, career as an academic and as a scientist He's uh, really a good person. He's really nice people. And um, welcome again. And I think you have about uh, 45 minutes. Right. And after all, at the end, there will, go to, uh, there will be some, some questions. And thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Just let me explain. I mean, this is, this is basically the way people, uh, Peter likes to give talks. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit, you know, informal. <laughs> he has something on, on, on one of his legs, so he's obliged to, to be like this. Indeed, I should again uh, thank you for coming because in these conditions, uh, I, I, we really appreciate the effort you are, you are making. Although I know you are having a lot of fun spreading science and talking about your work. So uh, thank you very thank much. You again. Thank you very much for your kind words and for inviting me here. I, I too have always remembered with great fondness those days at the Val It was a, it was the last two months of n just about of 1990, the last two months before Christmas anyway. So it was a very memorable, very happy time. Um, I want to talk uh, today about um, work which took place over I guess about a decade um, with uh, James Ryman, John Rice, Ming Lee and um, uh, Marc Chanton. James Ryman was a PhD student of John Rice who, who was at Berkeley. Ming Lee was a PhD student of mine and Marc Chanton uh, was a, a colleague. I think in those days he was at um, North Carolina State University. Now he's at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia. And it's about um, applications of uh, function estimation motivated by work in astronomy. So let's see how we, how we go. Um, the interesting part of this work is that the functions we estimate are, are periodic, at least in some sense. Sometimes the, the model says that they're exactly periodic. In other cases, the model says they're a superposition of periodic functions. That is, the true function is a sum of, say, three or four periodic functions. And in other cases, the, it's a periodic function, except that over time, the period and the amplitude, the period and or the amplitude, are slightly changing. All of these um, models are appropriate for different light curves of stars in, in the heavens. Um, and uh, the important motivating issue here is that uh, the there are quite a few. Uh, stars, probably millions upon millions, um, that uh, that radiate light in a periodically changing way. 
Uh, in some cases, it's exactly periodic, or at least it's exactly to the, uh, the ability of our measurements to uh, determine it. And in, thank you, thank you. And in, in other instances, as I said, uh, the, the period and or the amplitude might be changing over time. The first periodic variable star was uh, Mira, Latin for wonderful. Um, it was discovered by the, um, the astronomer David Faber or David Fabricius, Fabricius rather, to give him his Latinized name. He was a minister of religion in Frisia, which is now part of Germany. And uh, he first um, made observations using some of the very first telescopes uh, that were available in, I think, about 1496. And uh, he and his son, Johannes, made quite a few contributions to astronomy. Um, it, it is f the first explicit mention of, uh, of, of this periodically variable star, that is the star whose, a star whose brightness changes in a periodic fashion over time, uh, was made in uh, the, the writings of uh, Faber. Um, there is some evidence, although it's not as strong as in other cases, um, that the Babylonians, the Chinese, and the Greeks had noticed it before. Um, although, uh, although Faber Sr. and his son Johannes used some of the first telescopes in their work, particularly um, in, their, uh, in their important contributions to the study, the study of sunspots, uh, the star mirror is visible to the naked eye. And um, its period is 332 days, which means that the period is just a, uh, a few weeks shorter than a year. And uh, um, you can see it with the naked eye when it's at, bri at its brightest point. When it's at its weakest point, you can't see it with the naked eye. And um, so you, you don't actually require a telescope to, uh, to um, appreciate the variation. And that's why there's a potential for these early uh, these early astronomers from, from Babylon, China, and Greece to have uh, known it. Um, Faber and his son were the first to record um, through a telescope uh, sunspots on, on the sun, and the, the Chinese there certainly have a claim to having, having done that earlier, I think without benefit of a, of a telescope. Um, the way in which a a sun or a source of light in the heavens might be uh, m the reasons why it might vary with time are, are many fold it depends um, on the particular light source the, the most simple for a layperson like me to explain to you is that of what's known as eclipsing binary stars where you have one star rotating around another um, from the point where the observations are made it might be difficult to discern that there are actually two stars but you can imagine it when those two stars are rotating one about the other, that when those two stars are aligned with one behind the other, that's when the brightness of this, of this light source is going to be at its lowest. When the stars are separated so that their light is, the, the light of one is not occluded by the other, that's when the light source will be seen as being at its brightest. So you can see that if, if you have one star rotating behind the other repeatedly in a regular fashion, over time, you will get a from from a, a position a long way away a sense that there is simply one star out there whose brightness varies regularly over time. But there are many other sources of of this variation. Um, Mira, uh, this first observed periodic variable star, has uh, the the source of the change in brightness. There is is internal machinations of the star. There are uh, processes going on in, inside the star, not due to occlusion. Although Mira is actually two stars, uh, Mira A and Mira B. Um, uh, Mira B is the smaller, older star, and it rotates around Mira A with a period of 500 years, about approximately 500 years. Um, so you can see there's a long way from, long distance from one Christmas to the next if, you're, if you happen to live uh, over on, on Mira A. Um, uh, if that 500 years is so far from being 
from the 332 days that you can see it has this rotation has nothing to do with the period of, of Mira A. Um, eclipsing binary stars have periods varying from a few hours to more than 20 years. Cephids have periods of up to two months. Long period variable stars have periods up to several years. These are the three main different sorts of periodic variable star. Um, this is a uh, false color image of mirror A and B. Mirror uh, A, the big red dot here, is the one which has, uh, which radiates light over a period of, uh, so with a period of uh, 332 days. It is a red giant and towards its, towards the end of its life. But mirror B, which is this blob down here, um, is a, um, uh, a, a white dwarf, it is much older than Mira A. So this star at the bottom here, the bottom left, has been around for much longer than um, Mira A. And uh, I think that's probably about all I need to say. Uh, Mira A is a long period variable star. Light curves, well, uh, light curves are the common I get rid of this thing. I suppose it'll behave itself over there. Um, <coughs> light curves are the name that astronomers give to a graph of the change in brightness as a function of time. Um, astronomers tend not to distinguish all that much, but uh, certainly in in nomenclature, between the observed light curve and the theoretical light curve. Where statisticians spend a lot of time awake at night wondering about notation for these sorts of things that doesn't seem to bother my, my colleagues in astronomy much and in particular they, they don't talk about true light curves and observed light curves, they talk about light curves. Um, uh, brightness is typically measured on a logarithmic scale so you, are, you have negative brightness as well as positive brightness, that shouldn't disturb you at all. Um, I have worked a little with astronomers and I must say I find them the most wonderful people to work with. They're very generous in their data. Um, the only problem is that they often give you too much data. If you, if you thought that the world was um, swamped in genomic data, you ain't seen the astronomers yet. Um, there's, a, there's, a new tele, there's a new telescope opening up in Chile shortly, which will produce some terabytes of data every night. And of course it's going to do that every night forever and ever, as long as, long as the National Science Foundation can afford to keep it running. And so they make our, our hordes of data coming from uh, genomic uh, analysis uh, look minute in, co in comparison. Um, this um, next uh, slide gives you some idea of what I'm talking about when I'm referring to periodic variable stars. Um, these, look at, let's look at the top two panels first. On the vertical axis we have brightness um, on a logarithmic scale, so you see it takes negative values. On the horizontal axis, we have time measured in days. And uh, this is only a, a plot of part of these data. Every dot there represents a measurement, and the obliging astronomers, as they sometimes do, have constructed error bars around, around each measurement, which, have got, which reflect uh, observation conditions like cloud and and um, other issues which, which um, influence uh, the brightness of the star. So here, uh, time is measured on a simple linear scale. Um, I think the data up here are in the red part of the spectrum. The data in the panel below are in the blue part of the spectrum. But they're, they're made at the same time and of the same star. Um, and it's common to make observations at approximately the same time every night, although they tend to be jittered a bit. And that's for good reason, as, we, as uh, we'll find out later, as long as I remember it. All right. Now, when you look at these two figures at the top here, you see there's very little influence of any pattern at all. Okay, it looks like these are completely cha chaotic. There's a, perhaps they tend to be more often towards the high part of brightness scale, less often towards the low part. But you don't have much, much sense that there's any order here. However, if you take this... Each, uh, either of these uh, panels here and you um, imagine wrapping the time axis around a circle whose diameter, sorry, whose circumference is equal to some approximate, a fairly good approximation to the period 
of the radiation in that star. And then you uh, um, unravel, you, un you undo from the, the disk, from the circle that you've wrapped this graph around, um, a little interval of length equal to the circumference of that disk, and you replot all of the data, if you can imagine what I'm talking about, you get these two respective curves down below. So what we have along the horizontal axis now is not, um, uh, not, not in terms of days, but plotted in terms of fractions of the diameter. Um, and you can see that what was disorder up here in these top two figures has snapped into, st into stark focus as very sharp graphs of the brightness of the star as a function of time. So uh, uh, what is interesting about these graphs is we have, we have a fair amount of data. In, uh, there are several hundred data points in each of these graphs. But um, despite all of, the, uh, you know, the, all of the errors and so on which are involved, you hardly need a statistical method to estimate um, this curve here, and you hardly need it to estimate uh, the, the period. Because as you change the period, uh, this is not visible from these graphs, but if you were to repeat this experiment by wrapping the data around your disk uh, several times uh, with slightly different disk circumferences, you will find that for most of those disk circumferences you'd get a disordered plot such as you get up here, but if you get very close to the, the right disk, disk circumference, suddenly it snaps into fast focus like we see here. And this enables you to estimate uh, the period, the correct period, the, the true period of the periodic variable star very accurately from data such as these. And when I say very accurately, I'm not talking about something which is efficient in the usual sense. The rate of convergence of your estimator of period is faster than n to the minus a half. It's not even n to the minus one. It's n to the minus three halves. So you have an estimator which is really super efficient. And you get that super efficiency without making parametric assumptions about the shape of, the, of, of this light curve here. This, this periodic function, which I'll call g in, in my notation shortly, uh, you make only smoothness, uh, smoothness assumptions about, for example, that it's got two bounded derivatives. That's all you need to be able to estimate the, the period, root, uh, not root n consistently, but at rate n to the minus 3 halves. So you see there's all sorts of wonderful things going on. Now I sh should mention that in the parametric context, that kind of result goes back to work of um, Barry Quinn and Ted Hannon in the 1970s, other people in the 1980s, um, but in the parametric context where you, you have in their case a, uh, a, a, a sinusoidal uh, model for the, the periodic variable function. What I'm saying is the same results about fast rates of convergence go over to the non-parametric case. All right, let's quickly gallop along a bit now. We've set the... Uh, stage for what we want to do. We're going to be fitting a regression model that is basically standard with a few twists. Uh, yi is the brightness on a logarithmic scale and we're saying yi is equal to some function g of xi where xi is time plus epsilon i which is experimental error. Um, and this uh, model of course is standard to statisticians. What we're going to have is a couple of twists. Um, the the first of these twists is that um, we, there is no sense in which the observations be, in time become closer together as sample size increases. Conventional asymptotic theory says that we allow this thing called infill asymptotics. As uh, n, the sample size increases, the, the, nearest, well, the, the nearest two points always get closer and closer together. The, the observations uh, become dense in time. The observations don't become dense in time because we keep ob observing them in times in the present and the future. It's only when we fold them around the circle, as we are talking about before, that they have an opportunity to become dense. And the other critical difference here is where, where we're going to be arguing that the function g is 
is a periodic function. Although our, our, our analysis is going to be non-parametric, we're going to have to factor that in at some point. To what, how do we define um, the function g being periodic? How do we define its theta? Uh, its, its period theta? Well, it's the smallest value of theta here such that this relationship holds for all t. So uh, if g is a periodic function, then there exists the smallest theta such that this holds. I, I, I mean, assuming here that the function g is continuous, and that's called the, um, uh, the, the period of g. OK, so um, when we go ahead and estimate g, we're going to use a fairly standard estimator. I'm using a very old-fashioned estimator, uh, the um, Natarea Watson estimator or the local constant estimator here. Um, one might employ something uh, more modern like a local linear estimator, although my American colleagues would argue that uh, there's a lot of evidence from the 19th century that their ancestors were working on local linear methods as far ago as that. But um, the, 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 one of the advantages of local constant is it's much more robust against uh, gaps in your, your design points. And that often happens in astronomy. For example, if you're making observations on a telescope, you often can't buy time on the telescope every night. You might be able to buy time for a little while. Then there are several weeks or months even when you can't buy any more time. So you need, a, you need a, a, an approach to analysis which is not, not sensitive to large gaps among data values. Um, what we do is we simply replace x, xi in the standard formula. xi is the ith time point by the value x i would take if it was wrapped around, the, if the data were wrapped around a, uh, the circumference of a circle with, uh, with circumference length equal to um, theta, uh, wrapped around the boundary of a circle with circumference theta. Uh, this means that x i of theta is x i minus theta times the largest integer strictly less than x i divided by theta. And with that change, this is a, uh, this is a standard Natarea Watson estimator. Then we, um, we fit this quantity by least squares. We choose theta to minimize s of theta, which I've written here. You have to choose the bandwidth appropriately to get an accurate estimator. I won't go into that in detail, but uh, bear in mind that it can all be done without difficulty. And the, the quantity theta that minimizes that is your estimator of uh, the period. All right. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, ways of, uh, about departures from this problem, uh, from this approach to estimation. One of, the, one of the departures that really interests me, which I'm not going to talk about because it takes us up paths that are, um, will, will take us longer than we have time for today, is where I have a superposition of, two fun of, of several periodic functions. And this is something that really interests the astronomers. Um, sometimes they superimpose these periodic functions to such an extent that what they really have is a, a non-parametric estimator. I think I've seen in the literature up to seven or eight different functions added up here. Um, so I find it much more satisfying if you've only got two or three. But nevertheless, that's a very interesting course to take. I should, uh, I mean, the, the astronomers I've known and with whom I've worked are very intelligent people. Statisticians would know that the periodogram was invented by them at the end of the 19th century. Well, the astronomers reinvented it all by themselves in the 1970s. And they did it right. They'd, I mean, it's, I, I suppose it's, uh, they, they wasted a bit of time, but they did do it very effectively. And the periodogram is their favorite method for, for estimating period. I've talked about least squares. Least squares has the advantage of being more efficient. It has lower asymptotic variance, but that doesn't concern the astronomers so much as it concerns statisticians. Um, so uh, it's, it's in that context that the periodic gram really comes into its own for estimating these multi-periods. I'm going to look instead, really, though, at the problem of estimating G when, it's, when, it's, when there's a single period, but it's slightly changing over time uh, because of, of things going on in, in, inside the star, which mightn't be at all clear to us, but we might be able to observe that the, the period and the amplitude of the oscillation are changing a little bit over time, uh, particularly 
it seems that in many time, in many instances, they are changing monotonically. So we, we usually need to only fit a relatively simple function, such as a linear function. Okay. Um, there's, there is a significant literature on this, and involves both the statistics and astronomy community. I mention here Hart, Kern, and Lombard. Jeff Hart's name, for it's him uh, I'm referring to here, was actually mentioned in discussion with some of my colleagues earlier today, but it, about something very different. Uh, Kern is an astronomer in South Africa, and some of you may know of uh, uh, Fred Lombard, who's a statistician recently retired from the University of Johannesburg. Uh, South Africa, like Australia, um, has the virtue of being in the Southern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, you look towards the center of the, military, of the Milky Way rather than towards the edge of it. The, our solar system is uh, towards the edge of the Milky Way. So if you, if you live in the Southern Hemisphere, you, you have much more access to, to data on stars than you do in the Northern Hemisphere, which is why this telescope I was mentioning before, funded by the US National Science Foundation, is built in Chile and not somewhere in North America. Okay, so there has been a fair bit of work done, this, uh, done on this evolving periodic stars idea before. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, think of the, of, of the period, uh, we're going to reflect the changes in the period through um, uh, a transformation of time. I'm going to write this transformation as T subscript X rather than T of X because that stops me from uh, having to write brackets around brackets around brackets in many cases. So let's imagine we have this monotone transformation T which takes time X to point Tx and so my evolving periodic function G is going to be expressed as a, as a fixed periodic function G0 of Tx where um, Tx is going to uh, is a function I'm going to have to estimate from data and it's going to reflect the um, evolution of the period. Uh, likewise, I, uh, or I, I should say um, uh, a simple interpretation of the period at time x is given by 1 over the derivative of, of the function t at the point x. This interpretation is got fairly quickly by looking at a simple Taylor expansion of the function g. g is the time varying, uh, is the evolving periodic function. Bearing in mind the representation I wrote down on the previous transparency, if u is a small perturbation, this then g of x plus u can be written of g of tx plus tx dash times u plus small order terms. And if I look at a function, say if, if g naught has period 1, which is what I'll assume in my analysis, then this, uh, if I think of... Uh, of you as, as uh, uh, I'm sorry, if I think of this remainder as being negligibly small, this function here has period 1 over, uh, over this derivative Tx dash. So that explains why we can um, interpret the derivative Tx as the period of the evolving periodic star at point x. Likewise, we're going to allow amplitude to vary slightly, um, and uh, we're going to multiply uh, this, this periodically, so this evolving periodic function by an amplitude which is also going to change a little over time and that gives us our final function g of x which is an evolving, which is a periodic function where the, both the period and the amplitude are allowed to evolve over time. We fit simple models for Tx and, and for Ax for the, uh, the changes in um, in, in period and the changes in amplitude. Uh, here I've given general polynomial models. Uh, if, we, if we were concerned about making these non-negative, which we might be, we look at them in their exponentiated form. Um, uh, in practice, we usually only fit these up to their first term. So if I, if I take all the thetas after theta 2 here to be 0, what I'm effectively fitting is a linear model for period as a function of time. And if I, uh, if I take all the omegas, all the parameters omega here after omega 1 to be 0, I'm effectively fitting a linear model for amplitude, variation in amplitude over time. And um, 
Be, be, usually, it, in, in my experience, it always turns out that these perturbation parameters, theta 2 and omega 1, are always very small. So um, there are no problems of identifiability, no problems of ambiguity that arise. In principle, there's a, there are a host of identifiability problems. Um, if, you, if you pose these, this problem of uh, estimating a, a periodic function which, whose amplitude and period are changing uh, of, uh, both over time, um, but because the changes are very minute, then that's not really an issue. All right, so um, where the model uh, is, is as it was before, a standard regression model, the only change being that now g is no longer a standard periodic function, a fixed periodic function. It's, a, it's, a, it's the sort of periodic function we looked at before, where the changes in amplitude and changes in period are modeled by these parameters. Okay, now the way in which we estimate these parameters is the same as the way in which we did it before, except now we have a small number of parameters, uh, so we have a larger number of parameters. Before we had only one parameter, which was the period. Now we have two parameters describing period and its evolution, and one parameter describing amplitude. And so we have three parameters in all, but once again we simply fold the data, we, we imagine a folding the function around the circumference of a circle, and um, we, um, we uh, then minimize the, the, uh, the, the resulting squared error that arises, and that gives us estimators of the parameters. Okay, can you tell me how, how much time I have left? Um, okay, uh, say 15 minutes? 15 minutes, okay, so I can slow down a bit. I've been I've been galloping along much faster than I need to. All right, uh, let me see. Okay, so um, yes, I was a bit um, worried that I would uh, not not get through everything. Okay, so uh, we solve the the least squares problem, um, sum of y i minus uh, g of x i given the parameters, all squared for the unknown parameters, and that's how we calculate their estimators. Um, the estimators obtained in this way um, have remarkable performance, as I indicated before, although before I only gave you one of these formulae, and only in the special case j equals 1, I said that the, in the case where the, uh, the, the periodic variable star is, is, is perfectly periodic, that is, the periods are not evolving, um, theta hat minus the true value of theta is of order n to the minus 3 halves in probability. And that's a special case of this formula here. Um, so what I'm saying is that in the general case where you have these polynomial models for the parameters uh, theta and omega, um, you get these remarkably f uh, super efficient or super fast rates of convergence here. Uh, the parameters which are further, uh, which are relatively high order, you can estimate very quickly. That might seem to be a contradiction, but you have to remember that in practice, um, these uh, the values of the true values of these these parameters, when you fit a high order model, are very small. So um, uh, as you go further and further out, this. Uh, uh, the, the, the smallness of these parameters um, uh, means that these convergence rates become not as remarkable as they might appear here. Okay, so the, both uh, the parameters for the evolving period and for the evolving amplitude, the parameter estimates rather, both have these, uh, these excellent uh, convergence rate properties. Okay, perhaps I, because I have a little bit of, of um, time here, Perhaps I should say a little bit about the, the, the periodogram approach to estimation, which I'm not touching on in any detail. The advantage of the periodogram is that, uh, of using a periodogram to estimate period, is that you don't need any tuning parameters. Using these least squares arguments, you need a bandwidth in order to construct your estimator. But uh, one of the reasons the astronomers use the periodogram is that they don't have to mess around with bandwidths. And um, using a, a, the periodogram approach, you just look for the position of a spike in your period in the, the periodogram, and I think you um, you take the 
uh, or you, you have spikes which are which are distributed uh, in a, a periodic fashion spikes in your periodogram you look at the distance between these spikes um, averaged over several dis uh, distances and I think you you invert that distance and um, multiply by 2 pi if I've got it, if my memory serves me correctly and that gives you your estimator of the period it's as simple as that now so that makes estimation of a of the period relatively straightforward um, as I said the, the statistical approach has the advantage in that it gives you significantly more statistical accuracy although all these methods enjoy that very fast convergence rate they all have that convergence rate of n to the minus three halves which is really um, helpful um, but in order to minimize uh, that quantity I called s of theta the the least squares criterion function um, you you would do that normally in an iterative way you would choose some theta uh, which you think is a fairly good um, a fairly good approximation to the minimum and then you would use uh, either newton raphson or some other sort of iterative approach uh, in order to refine that approximation until you you get convergence to the true local minimum now um, uh, this is actually a, a fairly challenging problem particularly in the case where you have multiple periods because it turns out that the least squares criterion has many local extrema um, so uh, using the the astronomers ch uh, choice of the of the period of the periodogram to give you a starting estimator turns out to be a very good idea in practice so that even though I've been applauding the least squares method here by saying it's super efficient um, it, to implement it in practice particularly when estimating period of a multi where of a superposition of periodic functions you you can actually benefit enormously from the the periodogram approach because it allows you to choose a very good starting point for your iterations and uh, especially in the context of um, multi-period multi-periodic functions that can be really helpful okay I want to finish by looking quickly at an example um, uh, these data were gathered by a team which included Mr. Z uh, Zilstra, who is an astronomer at the University of Sydney, and he very kindly gave us access to data. I have to say the astronomers are, are really good in that. I think I've said that before. Um, but compared to extracting data from medical researchers, let alone from a drug company, the astronomers are just on a... Well, I think they would like me to say they're on a different planet. Um, they, they really respond very quickly to emails and they give you as much data as they can possibly um, find. Uh, so uh, Mr. Zilstra and his colleagues had an alternative way of uh, doing this analysis and uh, to be quite frank we couldn't understand their method. Um, it was based on wavelets and we really couldn't understand why people would use wavelets anyway in the case of uh, nice smooth light curves. Light curves never have sharp discontinuities in them or anything like that. So we wrote to Mr. Zilstra and he very kindly provided these data. Now what is interesting about these data is their observations made over 101 years from 1900 to 2000 and I look at the first 51 years from 1900 to 1950 and then I look at the um, next 50 years from 51 through to 2000 and we'll see in the data some evidence of the way in which the accuracy of measurement has changed over that 100 year time scale. Um, Zulstra and his, his colleague reported a decline in the period of the star they looked at from about 420 to 380 days during the uh, first 50 years accompanied by a decline in semi-magnitude um, from this is half the sorry uh, semi-amplitude that's half the amplitude from 2.4 to 1.7 and um, they concluded also that the uh, the period stabilized to about 385 days during the next 50 years and the um, uh, the amplitude also stabilized so basically things were quite um, simple there uh, what I'm showing here are the data 
So what we have along the horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis is um, brightness. You can see that the, um, the lines here, the, the data are sort of lying almost in vertical lines. This is a reflection of the varying, partly of the varying periodicity, oh, sorry, of the varying brightness over time. But it's also a reflection of the fact that astronomers can usually get time on the, on the telescope only in, in uh, short chunks, like they might be able to observe the star every day for a couple of weeks and then the telescope's being used for something else for some, by, for, by another group for the next month and then they have to come back. So that's why you have these funny gaps in the data and also why the data appear to be in vertical, almost vertical lines. Um, these are the data over the next 50 years and you can see they had a, perhaps a bit more access to data. One of the things you see here is a bit less variation. Um, this reflects more the, the greater accuracy of observation in, in the last half century than in the first half century than it does anything about the, uh, the, the change in the periodicity of the function. Okay, so we fitted, using our method, um, uh, period and amplitude, with the period changing and the amplitude changing a bit. Um, uh, this was our, uh, our estimate of the, of the um, underlying period over the first f 50 years, about 420 days, and this was our estimate of the small perturbation in period over the 50 years, and this was our estimate of the perturbation in amplitude. Uh, this corresponds to a decrease in period, beca decrease because it's a negative sign there, from about 419 to 394 days um, during 1900 to 1950. This contradicts the magnitude of the decline reported by Zylstra et al. And um, in the semi-amplitude, um, it was reasonably common, uh, reasonably constant rather, um, varying not much, perhaps from about 1.71 to about 1.72. Okay, so these are um, illustrated in the top, um, sorry, the, the, the fitted curve after correction for amplitude changes and um, uh, period changes is illustrated in the top curve here. This is for the first 50 years. The same fit for the next 50 years is, illust is illustrated down the bottom. And the greater scatter up here compared to down here is, I believe, simply due to the improvement in observational techniques over half a century. Um, of course, uh, at any one point of each curve here, you have data from all points in that 50 years. So it's not possible to look here and look here and say this is due to early in the, in the 19th century and this is due to, the, sorry, early in the 20th century, this is due to the middle of the 20th century. The folding of the curves means that at every point here you have data from anywhere in the first 50 years and anywhere in here you have data from the second 50 years. This is what we got if we tried the same thing for our, for using the wavelet method of our colleague in Sydney and we, we really couldn't understand what their method was doing. Um, it didn't seem to give didn't seem to give the right results or didn't seem to agree with our results and it didn't seem to give the right numerical um, answer either. We got similar results in um, when we fitted the data to the, the method. So we used our method for the last 50 years of data um, during the period from 1950 to 2001. Um, the period further decreased from 394 to 383 days, which contradicts the suggestion made by our colleague that it's virtually constant during that time. In order to try and answer this test, we developed a bootstrap, sorry, in order to try to resolve this difference, we developed a bootstrap test for the statistical significance of this quantity here. If this quantity here was zero, then, uh, or, or approximately zero, then you could arguably say that the period wasn't changing. Um, but when we apply when we applied our virtue when when we applied our bootstrap hypothesis test, it it demonstrated that this uh, non-zero value of theta two hat is highly statistically significant. So we we really do believe that the um, uh, the the period kept on decreasing all the way from 1900 to 2001, 
as, uh, which is in a bit of contradiction to um, what some of the astronomers said, but that's the way science progresses. Um, people uh, get alternative methods and then compare them. All right, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time, and particularly my, my apologies to people over there for not paying attention to them during the talk. It's because my leg was up here. So uh, please okay. accept my apologies. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Are there any questions? Okay. I'm going to leave this for the very end. Are there any questions? No. Yes, one. I do remember the first estimator in yeah. the first period. I can go back a little. They are different from those. Yes, they are, right. So then it is supposed that the, the, the parameter doesn't change, uh, should change continuously. Um, uh, oh, yes, we do. Uh, the, the reason we broke it up into f two 50 years lot, lots is because our colleagues did the same thing. So we wanted to compare our analysis with theirs. Um, uh, whereas if, if we were doing it all, or, or, and also it, uh, making that change does allow us to see this, this obvious difference in accuracy. The, the experimental error is greater in the first half century than it is in the second half century. So there's some virtue in doing it. But if we wanted to do a simple analysis, we might, or we would fit the, the, um, uh, the model over the whole century, and we might fit uh, a quadratic term as well, which would be very small, um, with a view to uh, seeing um, how that change, uh, how, how that, uh, uh, how that explained additional variation over 101 years. Uh, I see you up the top there. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think what I see looking at this graph is that the the periodic model doesn't completely uh, explain the data. Um, this is it's much more clear down in the lower panel. Up in the upper panel, it seems that the periodic model. Uh, or the slightly varying periodic model doesn't completely explain the data. Although, um, because it's um, because the uh, the changes in amplitude and the changes in period that you estimate are so small, then this whatever is going on up here isn't simply a reflection of some change in time. Otherwise, it would be brought out, for example, in our in in our um, estimates of theta two and omega one. So this, I see this this departure up here as maybe a reflection that these, for other reasons, the model doesn't fit all that well over the first half century. Yeah. Assuming that in those, in, in, in all these uh, analyses, yeah. the, the, the errors are experimental, yes. are statistical errors, but are, are included uh, systematical errors? Or is, uh... um, that's a good question. I, I don't know as much as I should about that point. Um, what I do know is that the, the astronomers do try to correct for systematic errors. At least, I guess they don't do that always, but. Um, some of the data sets I've seen, they claim to have corrected for systematic errors and put in error bars which are um, usually equal tailed uh, to try to account for stochastic errors. So I think when we, when we, if I can go all the way back to this data set here, um, when, we, when they plot points, I don't think those points are necessarily the exact reading they get. They do make corrections for systematic errors. Astronomers are great people. I, <laughs> I love working with them. Um, I, I, they, it's just a breath of fresh air after working with some other uh, people where the data are so jealously guarded. <laughs> Yeah. Confidence band. Uh, no, no, that's a very good. Uh, that's a very good uh, 
PhD problem for somebody. Um, we, I must admit, I never even thought about it. But uh, yes, it's, uh, it's certainly, um, some, and the, again, to, to, very much to the astronomers' credit, they're very interested in uh, quantifying the accuracy of their, their statements and their data and all sorts of things. So um, being able to put in confidence band is, bands is not something that the uh, that they would um, sniff at. Uh, you know, they, they would think it's, it's pretty good. Do you know that um, there's a chap, um, Mollenberg, uh, at university, uh, Catholic University of Leuven. I forget his first name. His wife, Connie Eertz, is an astronomer. And she's one of the people we got these data from. She won a big prize in Belgium just a few years ago. Sort of Belgium's, Belgium's Nobel Prize, Franke Prize. She won the Frankie Prize, I think, for quantitative work. And uh, she's an astronomer. She, uh, she was one of the people we've got data from. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to work with, with these sorts of data, I would suggest getting in touch with Connie. She's a lo I've never met her, but by email, she's a lovely person, really very generous. And, and the fact that she's won the Frankie Prize means that she's pretty darn good. So now let me thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>